First off, from the cast, please welcome Ty Simpkins. We have the screenwriter here with us. Please welcome Sam Hunter. Also from the cast, Sadie Sink. And the fabulous Hong Chow. In really great shoes. Hi. Uh, please help me welcome the director of the film, Darren Aronofsky. And also from the cast, Brendan Fraser. Welcome to you all. It's great to see you all. I think we got to share mine. Okay. Oh. oh. Well, it's okay. I can share this with you no, too. Sure. Sam Hunter, you wrote the play on which this film is based, and you wrote the screenplay. I'm curious to know if it was always your ambition to adapt this into a film, or was that someone else's dream that you obliged? Yeah, it was somebody else's dream, uh, named Darren Aronofsky, who, who, who saw the... Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, when I first wrote this play 12, 13 years ago, I, I you know, I, I, I didn't know if I was even going to take it off my hard drive. I mean, it was really just, you know, I was writing the play. I was trying desperately to be an off-Broadway playwright. Um, but, like, none of the stuff I was seeing was really, like, clicking with me very much in terms... I like the plays that I was seeing off Broadway, but like, uh, I realized that at its core, and I'm a pretty earnest writer, and I write plays that kind of wear their hearts on their sleeves. Mm. Um, and so I, you know, I wrote this play that was accessing a lot of personal stuff for me. Um, and so really just having it at, uh, you know, 125 seat theater at Playwrights Horizons, one of my favorite theaters in New York City, <laughs> was a miracle. Uh, and then uh, this was, you know, 10 years ago tonight, it was playing at this theater. And then uh, shortly before it closed on December 15th of 2012, I get a call saying Darren saw it and wants to meet with you. Wow. So it was completely unexpected. Um, so, uh, and you know, it's been 10 years of, of, you know, working on this as a labor of love. Um, and I'm kind of glad it took 10 years because it took 10 years to make it the right way, I think. Darren, I feel like there's no such thing as a telltale Darren Aronofsky film. They're all so different. That said, this one is so different, for, I feel like, from anything I've seen you do. What did you want to bring to this material? What would you say was kind of the overall vision for, from your point of view? I'm glad you say that, because a bunch of people today were saying it's just like all my other films, so I don't <laughs> really know. But that's great, too. Um, look, I... Uh, whoa. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Mr. DeMille. Um, so. <laughs> it is exactly. Um, there was a reason there was one mic too little. Um, um, the whale. The whale, that's right, that's why we're here. So, uh, you know, like probably the experience you all had tonight, the film starts and there's these characters that you don't know how you're ever going to connect with them. Mm. And there's a lot of prejudices and a lot of things are kind of brought up. And then um, a few minutes later, you start to kind of open up. And that experience was really deeply moving for me. And um, there were five incredible roles, which is, for me, uh, one of the most exciting parts of the filmmaking process is working with actors, 
but to have someone else do this incredibly hard work of creating this incredible text that could attract all this talent um, it was an amazing gift and then it was an honor that he kind of gave me such a personal piece of himself to amplify and to give you all the same experience. One thing we sort of stumbled on, a lot of people were talking about the pizza guy. We did press all day, so we're all a little kind of exhausted. Um, and so I'm gonna, we're all trying to answer the questions differently. Um, but uh, one thing that came up really interesting was the pizza guy, which is something was one of the first things that uh, Sam added when he adapted the screenplay. And he's such a good writer that I had forgotten it. And I, it actually became a false memory. And I can remember sitting in the theater and seeing the pizza guy on the stage, <laughs> although that never happened. Um, but what's amazing about the pizza guy and why it works so well is what I figured out today was that um, the pizza guy's us at the beginning of the movie. That's exactly how we all are when the film starts. And then 100 minutes later, we're suddenly like, we know Charlie, mm. and we're really connected to him. But that's to remind you what the rest of the world um, sees. Mm. So I have no idea if I answered your question. You did. Was, OK, good. <laughs> you did. And probably in a different way from the other 20 <laughs> times you were asked it today. <laughs> Brendan, can you remember like what was the first thing that you decided to do by way of preparation when you agreed to take on this role of Charlie? Was, was there a particular type of research or something you particularly wanted to delve into first? I didn't know if I had the job. I met with Darren in January of 2020, and it was very cold. Uh, I had a small measure of creative intimidation to meet with this world-class director who challenges the human condition and offers up no easy answers. I had admired his work and I knew that he had gotten some really great performances from actors in films that I really enjoyed, like Mickey Rourke and The Wrestler, Black Swan, going all the way back to Pi. And I wanted to get on board. I wanted, I wanted to work with him. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I was just allowed to. He had to find out if or not he could make the movie. Um, the challenge was to put an actor in place to portray Charlie, who is a man that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds and has been living alone, has been harming himself by overeating consumption, has certain regrets, and very little time, Monday to Friday, as you recall. And desperately wants to connect with his daughter in a bid for redemption, if at all possible. Um, sign me up, is what I felt. But we couldn't get underway until there was a reading that they proposed. We went to St. Mark's in, in the, where's it, the village? Yeah, St. Mark's Place, the village. We staged a reading for Sam. Sadie was there also. And um, then promptly we all went home and then March 2020 rolled around and we all put our sweatpants on for a little while, right? <laughs> um, I heard from Darren later on that November in a text message in typical fashion, starting the conversation right in the middle. <laughs> Read this, watch this, um, think about this. I'm like, wait, did I get the job? He's <laughs> like, so, yes, now get to work. I'm like, yes, sir, yes, sir. I was delighted. The first thing I did was probably whoop and holler a little bit, but I also <laughs> felt a little bit um, of uh, mindful uh, reserve. Mm -hmm. I knew this was something that um, I'd better get my head in order for, and it was a part that that made my teeth sweat. I wanted to do it so very badly. Mm. I'm glad you did. Um, Sadie, I took note of seven, and I'm sure there's more that I didn't type into my phone, seven descriptions that people in this movie have of Ellie, your character. Here are the seven I took note of. Awful, <laughs> amazing, stupid, perfect, a terror, beautiful, evil. My favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you fall? Well, what would, words would you use? 
like what would I use to describe Ellie? Um, I think amazing, because that could go either way, kind of. <laughs> um, well, my favorite, which my brother told me after he watched the movie for the first time, he described her as a dirt bag, and I thought <laughs> that was an interesting way of putting it. Um, but I think that's the beauty of this character. Oftentimes when I was playing her, I had no idea. There'd be certain scenes where I would, I'd feel a lot of empathy for her, and then she'd do something, and I'd change my mind, and I wouldn't be able to understand it. But I think it all just boils down to like the pain that she's in, and this her father really, really hurt her. Mm. And over time, the only way that she's been able to kind of deal with this pain to distract herself is just through just bizarre behavior and this rage that she has. Um, so looking at it from that perspective, I, I think was important just in terms of you know, really trying to justify her actions as much as possible, um, at least in, from you know her mind. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, she's, she's a lot of things. A she's nascent, a brilliant things. author in the making. That's yeah. what Charlie sees in his daughter. Absolutely. Hong, um, I'm curious to know the revelation of Liz and her brother, who, who he is and the connection to Charlie is so interesting. I'm curious to know whether you experienced that reading the script. Were you pitched that? before you read it or how how did you experience that revelation and what was your reaction to it i was not pitched anything <laughs> i i was actually a little jealous when i learned that brendan and sadie had done a reading of this back in uh, january 2020 mm -hmm. i wish i could have been a part of it but i guess something in the divine timing um i was uh i found out i was pregnant and a few days right before the, the lockdown and um, so I I was in a very happy place I was not thinking about going back to work or anything and um, very happy to be a parent for the first time so my agent sent me the script I, I wasn't familiar thank you Darren uh, I wasn't familiar with it uh, I I was almost afraid to read it <laughs> because I just knew I was at a place where I didn't know if I could um, dedicate myself to something uh, outside of my family. But I did, I read it, and I was just overwhelmed by the ambition of it. I think it's um, ambitious in terms of the, the emotion and ambitious in terms of uh, retaining so much of the theatricality of the, the original stage play. And I was just curious about what Darren was going to do with it and how um, Brendan, I knew Brendan was going to do it. I was just really excited to see what he was going to do. Um, and. And the script just required many, many readings, just reading it over and over again because the scenes are so giant. <laughs> I have not read a screenplay where scenes just go on for pages and pages and pages without any sort of break. Um, and that relationship between Liz and Charlie is so deep and has so many layers and it was difficult to uh, I think it was more difficult to tap into the, the dark part of Liz because it was so easy to fall in love with Brendan and to create that friendship and fi find that playfulness. I found it more difficult to, to play with those moments where she's really frustrated and angry with him. And, um, you know, those, those were, you know, big, big days uh, when, when, when we were doing that. But um, I had Brendan, all I, all I had to do was look into his eyes and it, it just came. That's great. Ty, Thomas is such a fascinating guy. He's a guy with a big secret, right? That we learn halfway through the film. Also must have been so interesting for you to play the duality of the character, to play him as we're supposed to see him and to play him as he really is at the same time. How was that for you and what kind of conversations did you have with, with Darren or Sam or anyone else about 
getting that right? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it was a very interesting thing because it was something that I've, I mean, on top of this being the first complex character that I've ever played, like, it was kind of, you know, hitting it out of the park with how complex it is because that was a very hard thing to do. Um, but when I, I got to set and I, I started talking with Darren and, and, and Sam, um, that was pretty much like what we really focused on because that was going to be the hardest thing to do. Um, and, you know, o over time, I think it, I got very comfortable with it. And by the end of it, we actually went and, and redid some stuff in the beginning because I understood the character more. Um, so it, it was just, you know, about everyday conversations about finding the character and, and what it meant to kind of what he was going through, what everything, like I knew anytime Thomas was saying a lie that sometimes maybe the audience can't even catch, like I knew that that was a lie. Like in the beginning, you see, he comes in and he says he doesn't have a phone. That's the first lie that he tells. Like, you know, there's so many things that go into it that just kind of build up over time and it just starts to make more sense. And Sam, that brings me to my next question for you because the script is so fascinating in how it, in how it doles out information for us, right? Uh, secretive information, who Thomas is, who Liz's brother was, who wrote the essay that is bring Charlie so much comfort. How did you in the writing of it decide when to parcel out all this information and was it similar in, in the play as well as is in the screenplay? Yeah, it's actually uh, <clears throat> pretty much identical. There are some things that are that are different. Like um, in the play, there's Charlie gives a whole monologue to Thomas's character about Alan and and what happened to him. But in the screenplay, I opted to tell that story through the the uh, unused second bedroom. That's kind of the archaeology of of his past with Alan that's been sealed off and is kind of you know. Almost, I almost thought of it like you know those medieval paintings that kind of dull over over time with resin, kind of in the same way. Um, but yeah, no, the the event structure is is identical. I mean, in, in terms of sort of like how much I'm parceling out the information. I mean, in a first draft, you just write in, from a very instinctual place, and I think it wasn't until I got to the monologue that that Hong's character gives to Ty uh, in the play. It's done in the room, but in, in the movie, it's done on the porch that I realized like, oh, I hadn't re revealed this to the audience until this point. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, that's a good thing. Cause that means that I'm not forcing something, I'm allowing the, so, so I think like, I, I never want to muscle the writing. I never want people to be thinking about like me and the craft when they're watching something that I watch. Cause w w when I watch a play or a movie and I feel like I just see the mechanics, I just kind of, it's like I, somebody hits the power down button on me. I'm just like, oh, it's the writer. You know, uh, so so hopefully it's like all coming out in a way that like human beings would actually reveal these things. Darren, how did you arrive at how we as an audience meet Charlie? This kind of interesting, we see him, you kind of introduce us to him from behind. He's in this intimate moment. Was that all spelled out in, in Sam's writing or how did you decide from a directorial point of view how we would meet him? Well, the scene was, uh... The opening scene in the play, I believe, was the same as the opening scene in the film, yep. except we added some of the expository writing. Although that was there a voiceover? That was in the play. It yeah. was in the play. But the idea of having the zoom with the camera off and the push in on the zoom um, was something that um, I, I don't. Was it in? The, did we work that out? Yeah, oh, yeah, we, we talked about okay. that a lot. Yeah, sorry, it's a long time. <laughs> Ten years. It was a while. There was many, many, many drafts along the way. Um, so it was always, uh, that was a really hard shot. That was the first shot that we had to do. It was the first shot when we were dealing with the makeup. Mm. It was also probably one of the most ambitious shots because it was like a 270 um, mm. with a very, very, very minimal crew. And there's things like, uh, as the camera approaches him, there's a carpet there. And the carpet is actually like in six different pieces. And mm. as, the do as the camera gets close, all those pieces have to be like, sucked out by people on fishing lines away so that the camera could smoothly move around. Hmm. Um, and of course, we didn't have much time. We probably had it less than half a day to get the shot. And it, it was kind of, I, you know, before you, um, as a director, you're sitting there, okay, this is a gamble. I know I have a great crew that hasn't worked in a while, that's really hungry, they're excited by the shot, but it's probably technically one of the most difficult shots of the film. Do I get everyone to go after something really hard 
at the first chance and, and feel great about themselves, or do I potentially fall and fumble and um, have to come back to it later? Um, but great, great people, great technicians, and um, we were able to uh, to really pull it off. Um, so why did I do that? Um, I thought the uh, I would like the audience. I, I was thinking where the audience is. Um, another great thing I've been talking about my mentor a lot, but another thing my mentor taught me, Stuart Rosenberg, great director, was he always had a sign on his desk that said, "Where is my audience now?" Mm. And so that I think about that. So like, where are we at the beginning of the film? Okay, I knew people would know that they're coming to see this movie, and they were going to see something intense and how to slowly kind of tease it out and reveal it. And, um, and, and also what's going on is pretty kind of intense and shocking. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was just about slowly kind of bringing the audience into this emotion. That's where the shot came from. And Brenda, there's such a sensitivity and thoughtfulness to your performance, so I guess I wasn't surprised when I saw Lee Cowan's beautiful story on you on CBS Sunday Morning over this weekend, where he mentioned that you had conversations with an organization called the Obesity Action Coalition. Um, I'd be curious to know how people from that group were most helpful to you. We partnered with them to advise about everything from the makeup to the story, um, but moreover to give us uh, really a mandate to treat Charlie with with dignity and with empathy. Um, and I, I took that duty very seriously. So Dr. Rachel Goldman, who um, advised us and partnered with us, a, a specialist in eating disorders, a psychiatrist, um, and the, the OAC is an organization of tens of thousands of people who uh, support one another whilst waiting for Everything from uh, medical procedures, bariatric procedures that could save their lives, to support groups, to yeah, look them up. If obesity touches your family or those you know in any way, they're an excellent resource. Um, and I spoke with maybe eight, ten folks who were so available and honest about what it meant to be bedridden, what it meant to have to rely on someone like uh, Liz in a fraught relationship that's all at once someone you love but someone you're enabling. It's difficult. Um, and I learned from them that how we speak of and to one another has gravity. And uh, I'll give you an example. They often told me about their youth and when they were young or they were very small there was always a figure, usually an adult, a teacher, sadly oftentimes a father, who spoke to that kid in a way that was recriminating and, and really unfair. And it stayed with them and it, it perpetrated, perpetuated, forgive me, um, habits that are on par with, as they explained, really with the greatest hits of whatever, pick your vice. I mean, it, it gets all the dopamine receptors going in our brain. And, and there are people who are helpless to um, uh, the consumption that they, they find themselves victim to. You don't need me to tell all of you this, but what it made is it underlined that it's very real. And, um, and again, we had an obligation to tell this story with dignity. Um, the nicest thing, and also I think the most poignant thing, was when we had opened in Toronto, I received a letter um, from the OAC in Canada chapter who said very nice things about the film performances, um, but also said that um, it's, it's infinitely possible that this film could save someone's life, mm. if you think about it, and that's good enough for me.